After 16 years of exile in America, Thomas Mann and his wife visit Germany. In Frankfurt, St. Paul's Church, the 74-year-old author receives the prestigious National Goethe Prize for 1949. The ceremony is followed by a day of festivities for the city and a standing ovation for the famous author. The German free youth sing, He who helps us save our city is our good comrade. The return of Thomas Mann from exile represents the return of an alternative Germany and this alternative, non-fascist tradition is celebrated. In the East, as in the West, the author is considered the legitimate heir to the bourgeois humanist tradition, a unifying national heritage. It is he, and not his brother and lifelong rival, Heinrich, who represents this alternative, liberal, republican ideal, and who symbolizes the birth of a new beginning. He is laden with triumph upon his departure, and the tragedy that has long shadowed the author's personal life is hardly perceived by the public. But while lecturing in Sweden, Thomas Mann receives a message that his oldest son, Klaus, has committed suicide at the age of 42 in Cannes. He writes in his journal, Everything has become wearisome. My sorrow, along with that of his mother's, is great. He should not have done such a thing. The father's reproachful tone and the impact of his own pain resulted in the following entry. Many nights I have thought about the long hand of death, the yearning for death, that which no one returns from, and the silence. Mann explained the despair of his son, who overdosed on sleeping pills in a rundown hotel in Cannes, as an inevitable result of a death wish. Thomas Mann did not interrupt his travels to attend his son's funeral, nor did his wife Katya or their daughter Erika attend. This apparently cool reaction to familial events revealed the deep and long-standing fissures within the family. New light on the father-son relationship was shed following the posthumous publication of Thomas Mann's journals, in which the artist depicts himself as sacred patriarch, both within the family and society. Diese Serie von Tagebuchveröffentlichungen war für uns alle, die wir den Thomas Mann zu kennen glaubten durch all of us who believed that we knew the real Thomas Mann were shocked by the publication of the journals. After many years, our eyes were opened to the light. This meant a new examination of his fascination with young men, with the forbidden, with the threatening and the destructive, and his simultaneous love for women. All this was endlessly examined and explained from the very beginning to the end. And now we know what we always knew. Now we knew where his thematic fascination with horrible yet undeniably fascinating interests came from. In the journals, the real Thomas Mann was revealed, a man whose deep-rooted sexuality was clearly homosexual and whose portrayal of heterosexuality was lacking in maturity. The hidden homosexual orientation of his erotic life described in his writings as finding stronger meaning in its aesthetic representation than through marriage and children, sheds a new light on his relationship with his son, Klaus. By attributing the suicide of his son to an innate death drive with no external causes, the father was arguing in his own defense. In his letters, Thomas Mann describes the morbid desires of his son, Klaus, as a deep-seated wish for exoneration. By so doing, Mann fails to acknowledge the hidden roots of his son's insanity, the family's deep conflicts. This is a family in which nun wirklich überauffällig in verschiedenen generations selbstmorde this is a family in which suicide is to be found in all generations. For example, both of his sisters committed suicide. 
Carla under very dramatic circumstances, and with his sister Lulu, no one is really quite sure of the facts surrounding her suicide. So to understand this, my thesis is that the brothers of this generation, Thomas and Heinrich, devoted much of their writing to death and suicide. And, of course, in the next generation, Klaus took his own life along with Michael. So the question is... Where are the roots of this? Are they to be found in the preceding generation? Perhaps in the tragic story of the mother? Does the story begin here, in a truly idyllic town with narrow streets and gray gabled houses? In his work, Turning Point, Klaus portrays the Mons and their hometown. What I understand as my own personal drama is perhaps only the prelude of a tragedy which took place in the stale atmosphere of a northern patrician German family not far from the shores of the North Sea. Taboos and incest remain alive in our family the deepest stratum of our existence atones for the guilt of our ancestors and our hearts bear the burden of forgotten grief and past torments. This is the Mann family house on Mengestrasse. Thomas Mann was to elevate it to symbolize the bourgeois family in his novel Buddenbrooks. This is Johann Sigmund Mann, the younger, Thomas's grandfather, the founder of the family fortune. He was known as the counselor. Sick his entire life, he was diagnosed with a bad case of nerves. Johann's second marriage, a marriage of necessary convenience, was to an older but wealthy widow, Elizabeth Marty. The elegance of the salon is oddly juxtaposed to the tension of those collected here. There is strife between the father and his son, Thomas, from the first marriage. His birthright as first son was revoked by the counselor, and Thomas could not bear his stepmother. In the chilly climate of this marriage of convenience, she became a religious fanatic. Johann detested his son, but nevertheless decided that Thomas should follow in his footsteps in the family business. At the age of 23, Thomas accepted this difficult inheritance. As the new provider for the family, he would be besieged from all sides. Next to Thomas is his stepsister, Elizabeth, the model for Tony in the novel Buddenbrooks. With her two ignominious marriages, she would cost the family much money. Last but not least, the brother Friedel with his wife. He served as the prototype for Christian in the novel, including his costly visits to the local bordello. Thomas Johann Heinrich Mann, a merchant against his will, liked to portray himself as a bourgeois aristocrat, a Lübeck dandy. Torn between duty and desire, he decided to marry, choosing Julia de Silva Bruns. She was an exotic beauty, the daughter of a Creole mother and a wandering Lübeck merchant. She had been brought back to Lübeck as a four-year-old after the death of her mother in Brazil. Sie und ihre Schwester kamen in eine Pension, geleitet von der bucklichten äh, Therese Bousset im Roman. She and her sister attended a boarding school at a convent. Throughout her childhood and up to her confirmation, she remained at this school. Konfirmiert wird, ist in dieser, verlebt sie in dieser Pension mit dieser Frau. Nur sonntags bei der Großmutter sieht sie ihre Brüder wieder. She only saw her brother when she visited her grandmother on Sundays. She wasn't even allowed to go outside of the walls for a walk. This left her with a lifelong desire to experience the life that had been denied her. Julia had great expectations as a newly married woman whose husband installed her in a modern new house. Her hopes, however, were quickly dispelled. The old town, known for its provincialism, narrow patriarchal structure, and strict moral code, collided with Julia's innate hunger for life.
above all, children were expected. She dutifully provided her husband with an heir, Heinrich. Then Thomas, Lulu, Carla, and Victor followed for a total of five. Thomas Mann Sr. built a new house in the style of the Neo-Renaissance for his growing family. Yet Julia remained restless and unfulfilled. Her desire for life and warmth and to return to her mother's homeland was difficult to quell. She suffered from sickness and the double betrayal of her father. He had disinherited his daughter and then had refused to allow her to marry her first true love, the man before Thomas Mann Sr. All that remained for this unwilling wife and mother, who as a young girl had wanted to go into the theater, were the music and dances of the salon. This facade of society replaced her unrealized dreams and also fulfilled her secret desires. Both brothers, Heinrich and Thomas, perceived their mother as a pleasure-driven woman who, as they say in Lübeck, took things to the edge. Julia's flirtations with young officers were common gossip. Her husband suffered in silence. Heinrich, raised on a mother's fairy tales, was soon dethroned by the younger Thomas. Als Thomas geboren war, hatte er die Mutter. Sie liebte ihn. Er war dunkelhaarig, Heinrich war, war blond. Sie hat was wiedergefunden, was sie an ihren Brüdern verloren hat. Ich glaube, Until Thomas was born, Heinrich had her all to himself. But Heinrich was light, while Thomas was dark. She had found something special in Thomas at the expense of the brother. I believe that Thomas represented what she hadn't found in Lübeck, something that was missing, as she admitted herself. Thomas soon got whatever he asked for, while Heinrich lived in a world in which his mother's favor had been unexplainably revoked. Thomas was the mother's black-haired prince. When he was an adolescent, the high school and the old Catherine convent became the theater for a youthful drama. He fell in love with the blonde-haired and blue-eyed, the adored Armin Martins. Then Thomas developed a strong desire for Villeri Tempe. This emerging homosexuality troubled Thomas. He felt stigmatized as a criminal and as a sick person. Instead of confidently feeling like a member of society's elect, he proceeded with extreme caution, lest his secret be discovered. Dieser andere, den er da plötzlich 15, 16-jährig in sich entdeckt, dieses äh, abstruse this otherness that he encountered at 15 and 16, this sickness and degeneration, had much to do with his own status as one of privilege within the community. His father was not only a senator and a man of industry, but a finance minister and his family belonged to the ruling elite. For the senior Thomas Mann, his office at the court became a burden. He was troubled by financial losses at the family business and squabbles at home. As a father, he was disappointed by the rebellion of his oldest son, Heinrich, with his literary aspirations and his decision to turn his back on Lübeck, all of this reduced the senior Thomas Mann to an old man at an early age. He died at 51 from what was diagnosed as blood poisoning. His will arranged for the sale of the firm and the family house and the expulsion of everyone who lived there. Of Heinrich, he said, My oldest son's tendency towards a literary career is forbidden. Its basis is nothing but daydreams. Lulu, my oldest daughter, must be closely supervised. Her lively disposition is to be carefully molded. Thomas was simply described as good-natured, but his mother was sentenced with the following. Always to be dependent upon her children. 
If she were to ever question her plight, she should read King Lear. The children were doubly bound. On the one hand, the will declared that they should remain true to their mother, as the father had directed in his last testament. On the other hand, the will severely restrained the mother's authority with the restrictions placed upon her. The children could not escape the father, even in death, but neither were they willing to follow his wishes. Julia left for Munich. Munich, at the turn of the century, was not only a southern refuge for her, but the center of the arts, the theater, and the bohemian life in general. Julia and her children rented an apartment in the Schwabing Quarter. It was as if she were finally free of all the requirements of etiquette and the pressure of Hanseatic society, with all of its conventions and narrow morality. Here, late in life, she would realize her dreams of creating an intellectual and artistic salon. At 43, she is still a beauty. She did not fulfill the conditions of her husband's last testament. The children were not carefully supervised. On the contrary, Carla, whom the father considered a quiet child, already had an admirer at 14 and began a career as an actress. Lulu's fiancé appeared to be just as much in love with the mother as with the daughter. Both brothers went to Italy. For Thomas, oddly enough, it was a particularly ascetic experience, as revealed in the following quote. To eradicate a bad desire, to free myself of sexuality, keep the dog on a short leash. The stay in Rome and Palestrina made both brothers into writers. Heinrich wrote his first novel, In the Family. Thomas started what would later become Buddenbrooks. Back in Munich, both lead a bohemian life for the next 10 years. Mark Strasse 5, one of Thomas Mann's many apartments. By the end of a decade, there would be a good dozen more, all similar, always on the top floor. The two brothers began to experience the results of their Lübeck inheritance and all that the senator's threats sought to prevent. They would become artists. The life of the artist was less of a problem for Heinrich than for his brother. Throughout his life, Heinrich would never marry for social station. He was free to live the bohemian life. Thomas, on the other hand, had come to experience the opposition between the bourgeois life and that of the artist, which he was to portray so successfully in his novels. He knew that it concealed a very dangerous sexual abyss, which had not yet been articulated in his art. His first attraction was Paul Ehrenberg, a painter. He was both an artist and a blond, blue-eyed ladies' man. Thirty years later, Thomas would write in his journal, Paul Ehrenberg, the central experience of my heart, an intoxication which I have experienced only once in my life. Paul Ehrenberg remained unattainable, and Thomas Mann tried to get over the shameful desire through writing. The recognition of his true nature was resolved many years later with Gustav Aschenbach as the symbol of desire. I love you. What took so long? Numbness, isolation, iron, spirit and art. Here is my heart, and here is my hand. I love you, my God, I love you. Das ist ein aufregender Blick in die Werkstatt, Thomas Mann. Und Werkstatt heißt zugleich auch Lebenswerkstatt. This is an exciting glimpse of Thomas Mann. 
his work and his life become truly indistinguishable. He lived in a mystical, homoerotic world, and what passed between him and Ehrenberg would be immediately transposed in the morning into a literary motif. What is so exciting is that Thomas Mann, the jealous sufferer so in love with the artist Paul Ehrenberg, transformed these feelings into the love of a woman in the fictional character of Adelaide Aida. She also suffered through unrequited love, and without doubt Thomas Mann simply transposed his emotions and experiences. This is illustrated in the notebooks by the change of the pronoun he to she. Through a female character, he transformed those experiences recorded in his notebooks into literature. Thomas marked the close of the Paul Ehrenberg chapter by moving from the bohemian life in Schwabing to a large residence at Königsplatz. In the old German High Renaissance Pringsheim Palace, Thomas Mann carved out the great affair of his life, a marriage to the daughter of the house. Success and fame as the author of Buddenbrooks had opened the door to the salon of one of the richest men in Munich, Alfred Pringsheim. The son of a Jewish mine and railroad magnate, Pringsheim was a professor of mathematics, a Wagner fan, and owner of a renowned art collection. Both Pringsheim's current mistress, and of course his wife, finally resigned themselves to the engagement. At the age of 20, Katja Pringsheim married Thomas Mann. The prince had found a princess who very quickly provided two children, one after the other, Erika and Klaus. Hedwig Pringsheim, Katja's mother, wrote, Katja remains apparently satisfied with her two children, but her husband is a real dandy who does not tolerate much. The country house, with the initials THM over the entrance, was built by Thomas Mann in 1908. It was the first of many such villas he would own and was home to the happiest period of his life. His artwork is inspired by an apparent dichotomy, how to embrace the bourgeois life and to still be an artist. With the success of Buddenbrooks behind him, before him lay a future as Germany's eminent national author. Katja uh, Pringsheim bedeutete für den jungen Thomas Mann das erlaubte Glück. Katja Pringsheim brought happiness to Thomas Mann, not the physical happiness he desired with Armin Martens or Paul Ehrenberg. She provided him with bourgeois acceptance that would allow him to follow in Goethe's footsteps as, as both an artist and as a representative of the bourgeoisie. Thus, it was necessary to disguise what would have been an obstacle to his success his attraction to men. Without doubt, he needed Katja. To a certain extent, she had rescued him from his Paul Ehrenberg period. In Toltz, he writes Death in Venice. In it, he is able to experience an alternative life through his literary alter ego, Gustav Aschenbach, an experience that had consequences and which the devil articulates in Dr. Faustus, you will never love. The Schweigharcht House in Pulling, a former convent in the south of Munich. For a long time, Katja lived here with her youngest son, Victor. It was here that she met the property's owner at a summer festival. In Dr. Faustus, the grounds and salon here will be used as the theater for the death of Leverkuhn and his nephew, Echo. It is the same place where Thomas's sister, Carla, took her life after a quarrel with her beloved in 1910. He would not redeem his promise to marry her and broke off their engagement. She ran to her room, locked herself in, and swallowed poison. Carla's act of despair reverberated like an echo all the way back to the childhood of her mother. Julia, in her youth, must have heard about a woman who goes into the theater and who is lost, a topos that appears often in the work of brother Heinrich. 
Skala eben nicht ähm, über die Provinzschauspielerin in, hinauskam, als sie Affären hatte. Carla found it difficult to return to a life of respectability after her time in the theater, where she had had several affairs. But when her engagement was broken off, I believe that Heinrich also gave up on her. She was no longer the innocent and proud young girl whom he revered, and I believe that she decided, at that point, that her life was ruined. I don't want this to be taken literally, but the theme did exist for both her and Heinrich, for him in his writing, and for her in life, and I believe that there is a connection. Many years later, Thomas's other sister, Lulu, also took her life. Her attempt to maintain a facade through the meticulous fulfillment of her duties as wife and mother with a man she didn't love failed. Heinrich writes about Lulu. To appear how one should, that is what destroyed her. The last photo of Julia, the senator's wife, during the final phase of her life, a poor lodger in a suburb of Munich. She died a morphine addict and an aging lover of young men. In her final years, Julia's insatiable desire for life resulted in a sickly restlessness. The house had long since been sold. Around her deathbed in Vessling, her sons surrounded her. Munich in the Twenties. Thomas Mann, shortly before the outbreak of the war, moved into his new house in Herzog Park. After the success of his latest novel, The Magic Mountain, he received international attention that included receiving numerous guests and fulfilling worldly duties, which he carried out with an iron discipline. The youngest son, Michael, remembers him moving on silent wings. This was manifested in the daily life of the Mann residence through coolness, distance, and an everyday formality that bordered on the ceremonial. Another son, Golo, writes in his memoirs, The authority of the father was enormous. We would always be quiet in the morning while he was working, in the afternoons while he was reading, and then napping, and then in the evenings because he was busy once again. A man of great instability, he barricaded himself within a silent life of letters. That which moved him most deeply, he could only divulge to his journals or transform into art. He precariously entrenched himself behind the facade of a conventional bourgeois household. He wrote in his journal, A life that conceals a secret. And toward Katya, he felt, my gratitude for your kindness regarding our sexual relationship and my sexual problems is deep and genuine. The number of children increased during this time. In addition to Erika and Klaus are Golo, Monica, Elizabeth, and Michael. The harmony in the photos disguises the many conflicts within the house. In front of the camera with the favorite child, Elizabeth. This staged fatherly pride hides the tension-laden relationship with Klaus that began during this time. Thomas Mann was sexually attracted to his own son. Delighted with Klaus, I find it only natural that I am in love with my son. Die Verliebtheit scheint äh, dann auch sehr schnell abgekühlt zu sein. Ja? Äh, this attraction appeared to be short-lived. In any case, it was much later that Thomas Mann realized that his son had developed into a homosexual. During this time, Klaus became aware of his father's tendencies, his incestuous and homosexual desires, mixed with paternal pride. Imagine somebody such as that, myself, for example, actually having children. This shouldn't happen. One could say that the homosexual son was simply projecting the homosexual identity of his father, mixed with his own self-hatred and contempt for him.
In review of four, the two oldest children of Thomas Mann, Erika and Klaus, provocatively describe the cultural scene of the 20s that they encountered. With Gustav Grundkens and Pamela Wedekind, they act out their own drama, in their lives as well as on the stage. Erika's relationship with the Wedekind's daughter is considered scandalous. In his first literary attempt, Klaus portrays his open homosexuality. In any case, Klaus was determined to get the truth out of his father, to entice him to come out of the closet and to admit who he truly was, what he truly felt. Thomas Mann denied it. With the rise to power of Hitler, the Manns began their exile. They emigrated to the United States. The dissatisfaction in Germany was so great that Hitler had to do something about it. In spite of all this, however, I am optimistic about the final victory of democracy. Thomas Mann, the unpolitical reactionary, at the beginning of the 20s, he had advocated against a democratic republic. He now hesitated yet again, until finally declaring himself in agreement with the anti-fascistic emigres. Above all else, it was Klaus who influenced the father with his own political beliefs, and who wrote with Erika that Thomas Mann represented an alternative Germany. In 1941, after a brief residence in Princeton, Thomas Mann built himself another villa in Pacific Palisades, a quiet suburb of Los Angeles. It was here that many other German exiles established themselves. Thomas Mann was already the undeniable and leading representative of German culture. Today, we feel that the United States has become the great stronghold of that culture of which Europe has was once a home. Less recognized, and at this time without any means, Heinrich Mann was on the run from the Nazis. He was forced once again to flee from exile in France and came to America in 1940. In this, the last chapter of his life, he was to sink into ignominy and poverty. Nellie Kruger, a Berlin barmaid, was his companion in exile. He finally married her in 1939, and she ended her life in drink. Alone and living in obscurity, Heinrich died in 1950. In contrast, Thomas remained the center of the exile community, even when Klaus noted in his journal, It is painful to see how more and more a tedious serenity surrounds him, much like that of Goethe in his later years. Thomas Mann worked on Dr. Faustus. One of the models for a character in the novel is his grandson, Frido, the child of his youngest son, Michael. Though Thomas disliked Michael from an early age, he was infatuated with Frido, even though he allows him to die as the beloved nephew of Adrian Leverkuhn in the novel. Ich bin auch schon gefragt worden, ja, wieso, wieso muss ich das eigentlich stören, da mal mit vier Jahren da in einem Buch und so weiter umzukommen. When I was younger, four or so, I was unaware of the situation. It's the sort of thing one realizes slowly as one grows older, that history falls into place like drops of water. You hear things from other people or remember things that were said from your childhood or, or realize much later what was going on after reading the published diaries of Thomas Mann. It's in your subconscious, unrealized. I only knew that I was his favorite grandson, that's all. Frido's father, Michael, who stood between Thomas Mann and Frido, wrote in his journal, alienation, coolness, even aversion. The father, engrossed in his own drama of death, deprived him of life. The family tendency towards suicide, to play with death, was already apparent by the time Michael Mann at the age of 40, he began to work at Berkeley as a professor of German studies. His preoccupation with death lasted for 15 years, and Michael's overdose at the end was almost expected. 
He knew very well what he was doing, and he had prepared himself for it. For Klaus, joining the army was the last chance to give his life meaning. Since the end of the 30s, he had constantly fought the depression that threatened to engulf him. He bitterly noted in his journal the recognition that his father received. Wherever he arrives, he attacks. Will I never escape his shadow? Are my abilities so weak? As his sister Erika became more and more his father's helpmate, he lost the single companion with whom he was close. Klaus wrote, To be so alone. How can one tolerate it? Die ganze Familie Thomas Mann ist durchzogen von Selbstmorden. Auch so etwas gibt es in Thomas Manns Romanwelt nicht. Es ist verdrängt. Und dieser unglückliche... His dependency on drugs and his struggle with his homosexuality came to an end at the age of 42. ...aus der seines Vaters gebeugt. Denkt er nach über das Urmotiv... There are frequent deaths in the Mann novels, but no suicides, even though suicide runs throughout the Mann family. And Klaus Mann, who was very unhappy in 1933, thought throughout the night in Paris about this central theme in his father's writings. Führung ist das Grundmotiv meines Vaters und seines Lebens und seines Schreibens. He conceived of this literary theme. Tod durch Abgrund, die Formel. Death, seduction, but never the fulfillment, as the basic motif of his father's life and work. The romanticization of death, of approaching the precipice but going no further. Denn ich habe allem nachgegeben. Der Lockung zum Tod, der Lockung zum Rausch und der Lockung zu den schönen jungen Knaben, zur Pederastie. This was also reflected in the pederastic elements in Thomas Mann's life, not just in his literature. Das heißt, Klaus Mann begreift sich als ein Sohn, der dem Vater der Vaterwelt den Gesetz... The entire night Klaus was tempted by death, by revenge. ...motiv war produktiver für ein ganzes Schreibleben. Natürlich das von Thomas... The son realized the horror of his father and what he represented. ...das Spiel mit der Heimsuchung, aber... ...and thus he acted. ...selbst im Leben riskiert zu haben. In Zurich, every day, one may meet the famous author Thomas Mann and his wife. He has returned to Europe, his homeland, to celebrate his 75th birthday. He does not allow either his fan mail or his success to hinder him from working on his latest novel. As I went to the kino on when I went to the theater on Wednesday, I saw in the weekly news program that Thomas Mann was in Zurich to celebrate his 75th birthday. On the following Sunday, I was at work at the Grand Hotel where I, I served cake. When I recognized Mr. Mann, I greeted him and he ordered a pastry. In his encounters with the then 19-year-old waiter, Franz Westermeyer, Thomas Mann experienced once again the bliss of love, which at the end aroused his desire for death. He wrote in his notebook, In the garden, the waiter from Munich. Handsome. And quickly concludes with the open realization Yet again to love, the exhilarating anticipation, the endless dreams. And even sooner, the acceptance of unrequited love. The unbearable despair and pain. The importance of world fame is nothing compared to his smile and a look from his eyes. And then he said that I should accompany him every day to get some fresh air to talk to him and to keep him company. I thought nothing of it. During this time, Thomas Mann wrote his essay, Michelangelo's Erotic. In a scarcely veiled identification with the painter's love for the beauty of his fallen ones, Thomas Mann's love for a man is once again transformed from the journals into art. 
My words are formed in his breath. What happened is nothing. Nothing happened. From this last experience of passion, Thomas Mann returns to the remaining fragment from Felix Krull. The origin of the Krull story and Krull's love affairs at the Parisian Grand Hotel began in Zurich. Madame Hupfle, Lord Kilmarnock, and the Twentyman family are in the journal. This fantastical and yet pitiful sustained enthusiasm for the incomparable, for nothing more in this world than the unsurpassable allure of manly youth, which was always my joy and my sorrow. The house in Kilchberg in Zurich. This will be Thomas Mann's last address in 1954 after his final return from America. The author was a lifelong virtuoso of balancing the strains of marriage and a public facade with his inner life. With his pious novel, The Holy Sinner, and the character of a pope with an unholy family history, Thomas Mann created a harmonious ending. Now only one thing remained to be done, to find reconciliation before death with his own conscience. Together with Katya, he traveled for the last time to his birthplace. At the courthouse, where his father had worked, the citizens of Lübeck honored him for the final time. Thomas Mann had proven himself a deserving citizen and a worthy son of the senator. Werte auswärtige Gäste und liebe Mitbürger. Dearest guests and Lübeck citizens. Glück und Wohlfahrt unserer Stadt. We offer thanks for our happiness and health. Three months later, Thomas Mann died. Thank you.